welcome everybody to the York Festival of Ideas. My name is Steve Levitt. I'm one of the lecturers here in York Law School and I'm also one of the supervisors at the Baroness Hale uh, Legal Clinic, which provides free legal advice to members of the public and where our students work on a variety of projects, including projects related to raising awareness about the climate crisis and law's place in that. Um, I'm going to just start by giving a few technical uh, and housekeeping points, and then we'll get on with our discussion. Uh, if you are watching live today, you can ask questions throughout using the question and answer button on your screen at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and it's available throughout the event. So uh, any questions you ask, we'll see if we can weave those into the conversation as we go along. But we'll also leave some time at the end for some questions and answer uh, as well. If you do have any technical issues, like a loss of Wi-Fi, for example, you can always simply rejoin the event using the original link. Um, also, please remember that today's event is being recorded. So if you do want to watch again, you'll be able to do so after June the 24th. Um, subtitles are available for this event, and you can turn these on or off using the CC Live Transcript button, which again you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Now, I'm joined today by Alice Bell. Alice is a climate campaigner and writer based in London. She co-runs the climate change charity Possible which works on a range of projects from community tree planting to solar powered uh, railways. She has a BSc in History of Science from UCL and a PhD in Science Communication from Imperial College London. She was a lecturer in Science Communication at Imperial for several years, where she also launched a college-wide interdisciplinary course on climate change. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Alice to talk to us today on her book, Our Biggest Experiment, A History of the Climate Crisis, which takes you on a journey of discovery through the history of climate change science from the earliest steps in the 18th and 19th centuries to the advancing realization that global warming was a significant problem in the 1950s. And Alice explores right up to today where we see the growth of the environmental movement, climate skepticism, and political responses like the UN climate talks. So Alice, welcome. Hello, oh, good afternoon. Uh, how's, how's, how's the weather where you are? It's beautiful here. Oh, it, it was raining when I went out this morning, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I I should warn that there's some building work outside. I think I've closed all the windows, but if you hear a bit of drilling, I do apologise. Okay, we'll, we'll bear that in mind as we go along. So, Alice, um, an absolutely fascinating book to read. Um, I have to say, very accessible for somebody who's a non-scientist like me, and actually not really much of, uh, I'm not really an environmental lawyer either. Um, I find it incredibly accessible, um, and full of surprises I think I think that's a, a key point for me um, it tells a long story of climate change science a surprisingly long story of climate change science going back at least 150 years um, when would you say people discovered climate change was happening yeah I mean it, it is a long story I in some ways it's it's a fault of the book some people would have wanted uh, uh then there is maybe a place for a book that tells the more recent history but i wanted to give people a sense of how far back the roots of this was you know people really think about climate change as a, a future problem or a recent problem but actually it goes back a long time um and people first had a sense that well people first in theory got the idea that at carbon dioxide if there was a lot of it in the atmosphere could warm the climate they had enough science to work that out in theory in the 1850s wow. there was a woman called Eunice Foote who did the first work on this um the classic thing about her is that she she wrote a paper on it it was mm. kind of noticed at the time and then everyone forgot mm. but then a man came along and said exactly the same thing and that was held in some sort of scientific establishment and there's a some of you might know there's a big center for research in climate change in the UK called the Tyndall Center it's named after him John Tyndall uh we've remembered him and mm. um, we've named a center after him and you know for the last I was always taught the last 30 years you know oh we knew about this in the 1850s because John Tyndall told us about this mm. but actually Eunice Foote had said the same thing a few years earlier but neither Foote or Tyndall in the 1850s had a sense that it was happening then. Now, we now know with, with all of the advantages of modern science that it was happening. It was happening like several decades before then because 
you know, inventions like the steam engine and also just sort of large scale agricultural work where we'd cleared loads and loads of forest to, to graze livestock had resulted in, you know, human actions had resulted in the warming of the climate in a, in a small way, at least. Uh, but they had no way of knowing, you know, since uh, data wasn't, there wasn't enough data stored up for people to look at trends over time. Um, instruments weren't, weren't necessarily sensitive enough. So they were just sort of saying in theory. And then it wasn't until later that century in the 1890s that some Swedish scientists even made the connection with fossil fuels. So mm. people, like, I mean, John Tyndall actually started his scientific career working on the trains, uh, the steam trains, and he saw the environmental impact of the steam engine on the British landscape. He wrote very movingly about it in his in his in his letters. Mm. Um, his his biographer Roland Jackson has a great biography of John Tyndall by Roland Jackson. And he mm. talks quite a lot about that, and he sort of saw the kind of countryside being eaten up and polluted, but he didn't make that connection with all the you know they knew in theory it could but they hadn't thought oh we're, we're burning a lot of fossil fuels this thing that we said could happen could maybe actually happen but even in the 1890s they were like oh this is something that would happen in the future because we're not burning enough and it wasn't until the 1930s that we had a scientist called Guy Callender look back at the data on on weather and temperatures going back several decades and looking at the data that we had on carbon dioxide levels which was slightly less robust but there was some and kind of put those two together and go oh that thing that they said in the 1850s was possible and in the 1890s they said we could do from burning fossil fuels we are actually doing and you know that heat wave everyone was talking about a couple of years ago that's that mm. it was still quite niche science i think in the in the 1930s and it was the 1950s i'd say 100 years after foot and tyndall mm that that was really established. Mm. Um, and that's when uh, Congress was first briefed. So sometimes people say to me, they go, oh, did you know that we knew about the climate crisis in, in 1856? And I go, yes, you just fit. <laughs> but, um, and I, I think it's powerful for us to say that and to go, yeah, you know, she had this visionary, uh, she saw something that is now so incredibly important to us and managed to see through all this noise and complexity of the world to see this thing that is really so important, but she had no way of putting it to the context of, mm. of you know, even the really big things that were happening around her with industrialization. Mm. And it wasn't until 1950s, really, that we caught on to that. But that was still a long time ago, you know? Mm. Well, <laughs> we're not talking years, about, yeah. yeah, we're not talking about, you know, the 1980s or the 1990s, so 1950s. And the other thing that's really important about this, I think, is that the scientist who, who really raised the alarm in the 1950s, Roger Ravel, one of several, but who's really key, he be briefed Congress on this. And also it was well enough talked about in things like Time magazine and New Scientist that it made its way into mainstream publications as well. It was on mainstream television in the US and the UK in big budget mainstream spectacular TV events of the time mentioned the thing that we would now call the climate crisis in the late 1950s. This was not a secret mm. that suddenly, you know, was picked up in the 1980s. It's, mm. it's been around a while. Mm. And I know one of the things that was interesting about reading the, the, the history, the development of the science was the notion that actually it could be a positive thing to have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in order to prevent global cooling and another ice age. And that seemed to be a, a kind of constant, uh, constant refrain almost. Yeah, I know there was something that is, it's slightly frustrating to read as someone who lives in the 1920s. You know, I was doing a lot of this, the writing of the book in the middle of the heat wave that we had the summer before last, which was <laughs> really, really hot. You know, in the middle of the like pandemic and everyone's just feeling the kind of social and cultural pressure and you're also feeling the air pressure. <laughs> and um, I was sort of like on a, a, a draft deadline for my editor, just sort of kind of reading back and like, oh, you awful people in the 1890s, you're just like, this is a good thing. I'm like, it's mm. not a good thing. <laughs> but it's also understandable because, you know, you do need a lot of, of science and understanding and data and reflection to really see see it as a crisis and as a bad thing. And I, it's interesting to say that I see that even the people who were going, this is something that we need to pay attention to. Even Guy Callender in the 1930s, he was like, this is real. And he really stuck his neck out and he was actually laughed out of the room almost in the, the Royal Meteorological Society for saying what was seen as sort of weird science at the time. And I think retrospectively, a lot of meteorologists see him as a bit of a hero. Um, he still thought it was a good thing. He was like, well, it's probably good for plants. And mm. uh, I mean, the other thing I think is really striking is it's British and Swedish scientists that are saying this. You can see why their approach to heat is slightly different. From, <laughs> oh, can I have some more of that um and you know it was also i'd say that the scientists who looked at it in the 1950s were very much geophysicists they were a geophysicist that were funded by the military a lot of the time they had a particular approach to to engagement with policy and an attitude to policy decisions and kind of power uh and relationship to sort of 
you know, they weren't ecologists that were necessarily thinking about worrying about risk. You know, there's a slightly different mm -hmm. way in which different scientific disciplines think about environmental risk, I think, and also have a different relationship to people in um, the parts of the world that have been hit more badly by climate change. Um, and so I think they were sort of coming to it with a bit more of a techno fix approach. They were like, all oh, right, well, this is a problem, but we've got the technology to fix it. Whereas when in the 1960s was the point where ecologists got involved it's really there's a um, the first international conference on climate change was 1963 mm -hmm. and it was held interestingly by a group of ecologists who kind of realized that these geophysicists were talking about something that they should be interested in and you see a very different approach to risk sort of come out previously it'd been like well this is an interesting problem we can probably fix it and at the moment it's just something that's like kind of intellectually interesting and the ecologists going this is something we might be worried about. And actually, I think we can connect this to things that we're seeing that's worrying about risk po uh, fish populations that could lead to you know, people being hungry or businesses going bust. And the geophysicists weren't necessarily thinking in the same times. They were very up for that conversation. And you then see really useful and interesting interdisciplinary approaches to climate change emerge from the 60s onwards. Mm -hmm. But certainly, you know, people like Guy Callender in the 30s were like, oh, it might be nice and warm. And in the 1950s, I think the initial response to it was sort of like, oh, the earth's doing something a bit odd that's interesting, mm, that is interesting. Uh, and then it was that kind of fear started in the 60s and that kind of modern approach to the climate crisis where we're like ah, mm. kind of that didn't really you know that grew over time so so why why history i mean we obviously we've seen lots of books talking about what the future might might look like and technological fixes all that kind of stuff but why why history I think it's partly because I'm a trained historian and uh, my, you know, my back, my undergrads in history of science, and I often come to scientific questions with historic, you know, uh, historic. I often come to scientific issues with historical questions. Uh, and when I was first reading up on the climate crisis, seriously, you know, I'm I'm in my early 40s, so I am young enough just about to have grown up with this sort of threat of the climate mm. crisis always being present. I remember studying about polar ice melt in primary school, kind of always being a bit worried and sort of thinking I should do something and maybe the rest of the world would do something but I didn't get really kind of that climate fear until the early 21st century you know after that big heat wave in 2003 and the kind of build up to of, a lot of people I think got very engaged with climate activism on the run-up mm. to the um the Copenhagen talks and I, I started to work I was invited by Imperial to do a bit more work on climate change and I was like right all right I've got for just thinking about this as one of many issues I care about to actually studying it mm. and I did what most people is, did which was start with the science and it taught me loads mm. but it only got me so far and it was particularly there's this graph um if anyone studied climate change they'll have seen it it's called the keeling curve and it's just the graph that tells us how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere and it's got a characteristic zigzag because how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere goes up and down with the seasons uh when the the trees um in the northern hemisphere grow the green leaves they absorb the carbon dioxide and then they go out and it, it comes out but it zigzags but what's happened over the last 50 years is it's also gone up and I was like, all right, this is, you know, an important graph, interesting, beautiful that it goes up and down. That's kind of the earth breathing. So, you know, it's a nice thing. But why does the graph start in 1958? <laughs> what happened in 1958? And who's keeling? And I guess most people who come to this don't really think to ask those questions. Mm. Uh, but because I'm a historian, I do. And so actually, the answer to those really helps me understand how long we've been thinking about this issue. And what I found when I started you know googling and looking up in sort of archives and stuff and reading up on the books that there were on the topic there is a huge host of fascinating characters that I just got so energized by their stories I wanted to tell other people but also it helped me I think you know my day job is as a climate campaigner it helped me understand the problems that I, I'm dealing with uh help me kind of the things that people don't say you know that don't make their way officially into the policies you're like well why did we make a silly policy decision like that or why did we let a te this technology get built rather than that well actually it's to do with personalities and a fight and just the coincidences of history and learning a bit more about that I think helps me understand how we built the world that we live in and so think about how we could you know rebuild some of it it's particularly I think more than the climate science it was Although there's all sorts of fascinating stories in that, and I learnt loads, I'd say the thing that's really helpful for me as a climate campaigner is learning how we build our energy system. Because we've built it in a very particular way, and a lot of that's just to do with coincidence. And just mm. learning that, I think, helps me think about how it might be rebuilt and unbuilt, mm. And, mm. and how you know we've got this challenge of having to build a whole new energy system very qu quickly if we're going to mm. decarbonise in the, in the way that we need to. So how could we do that better and not make mm. those mistakes again? Yeah, you, you talk later on, uh, right towards the end of the book, about having a democratic relationship with energy production, which I thought was really interesting. But let me just, let me, I just want to draw you back to the title of the book. Um, and, and in particular, 
um, the fact that you talk about an experiment, and I just, I'm just interested in your use of language there, because we've seen recently the Guardian is, has been recommending changing the way it talks about the climate crisis in its reporting. You know, you, you've, you've referred to this as the great experiment, um, as our great experiment. Why experiment? Why not say accident or uh, something like that? I mean, it was it was one of those titles where it was my working title and I wasn't entirely happy with it, but everyone else seemed to like it. So I was like, all right, that's fine. And I couldn't think of anything else. So it's, I'm not, I, it's one of those quick titles where I'm a bit like, I'm not sure about it anyway. <laughs> um, but the, um, I mean, the, the, you mentioned The Guardian. The, one of the things The Guardian did a few years ago was move from saying climate change to the climate crisis. And around the same time, I also changed my working title from being a history of climate change to being a history of the climate crisis. And I felt that that addition, that phrase, the climate crisis, it's an addition to our vocabulary and it's a useful one, which is why I've used it. Because what I'm not doing is telling a story of, of general climatic changes, which are much larger and often more to do with, uh, you know, other sort of geophysical patterns, you know, we could go all the way back to before the dinosaurs talk about you know the history of uh, you know and paleoclimatologists you know scientists whose job it is to look at the history of climate have a much much bigger story to tell which involves i mean a lot of what they do is is about this modern climate crisis because that's so important but there is a bigger story there now i wasn't i'm not interested in in that you know it is interesting but it's not the story i want to tell uh, i want to tell a very specific story which is you know the, the the movement the accumulation of greenhouse gases by human action over the last few centuries which is causing a very particular crisis and so mm. uh, i felt that that climate crisis phrase was really useful for me just to show a precision about what i'm talking about mm. um with the other larger bit the our biggest experiment the the biggest experiment comes from it's a phrase that was used by this guy roger Revelle when he was first briefing congress in 1957 mm. and he used this phrase a lot um in talking to the public talking to other scientists talking to politicians and it's one that other people picked up on uh, thatcher brought picked up on it she didn't explicitly mm. reference him but you can tell that it, you know his phrasing was an influence on her speeches in the late 80s on the topic uh, and she's just one of many who, who have used this sort of this phrase and um i i really thought it was very interesting it's a very it's an ambiguous there's ambiguity on it so mm. when the word experiment as a historian of science you're very aware of complexity of the word experiment and how it can mean so many different things it's kind of this idea like it's dangerous it's risky mm, an experiment mm. but and i think the later versions of how it was used by Ravel when he was using it later and when thatcher was using it they were using it to that effect and it's kind of there to that effect in mm. in my title but when Ravel first said it he thought it was he you know his colleague said roger loves an experiment <laughs> you know he's a scientist he wanted to see what would happen and he didn't see all of the you know the terrible um ramifications of it he saw it as something that was just a, a momentary blip in human mm. history and he wanted to study about the earth in a very mm. abstract sense and um there is a story about a lot of people experimenting with things sometimes deliberately sometimes accidentally um and learning from those experiments and there are so many other experiments involved in this big thing that's happened mm. um so i think that's why i thought about it initially and why also my editors and other people were like oh no keep it it works yeah um and then the hour I mean, this again is an ambiguous one and one that I'm a bit sort of in two minds about. Some climate writers avoid using the words we or our completely because mm. they want to emphasize the fact that it's very specific individuals that are causing this problem and a lot of other people who aren't. And that, you know, there's that phrase, we're all in the same boat. No, mm. we're not. Mm. You know, some people are in some big, well insulated boats and some have been shoved off into lifeboats and some are drowning you know <laughs> you know that that's that's important that we reflect on the inequalities of who is causing climate change and who is being hurt by it uh, and so my my instinct is normally with that to avoid using words like we or our mm. um but i also think there's a power in that and it shows the fact that there are lots of people involved and one of the things i really want to stress in the book is that climate change is a social problem and a social crisis it is caused not just by individuals no individual will be able to do have the damage of this alone there's mm. lots of individuals working together sometimes mm. deliberately sometimes accidentally sometimes dysfunctionally mm. um, and it is causing impact in in social ways as well it's not just about individuals it's about how it affects societies and cultures and connections between people um and so that is i saw a power and a use of that word but i am i do occasionally say oh i wish i'd phrase it differently <laughs> and I, I do invite as it says in the introduction i invite people to to think about the politics of words like our and we uh, yeah. and interrogate them when they're using them or when they see yeah. them when they apply to climate change
Yeah. And, and, and at the start of your, your book, in the opening chapter, uh, and I think this is kind of related to this discussion, you, you talk about um, one of the, you actually say, one of the slippery things about the climate crisis is that it, it doesn't hit people with a clearly identifiable thud. Is, is that something you have experienced yourself in your job as a campaigner uh, uh, over the last few years? I mean, yeah, it's sort of, I do a lot of work with, uh, at the moment, with things to do with traffic alleviation, alleviation and sort of like kind of, or challenging traffic domination in cities. Um, and there's lots of people I work with who are kind of like, well, climate change is a background question for us, you know, we're more about air pollution, which is Fair enough. I mean, equally, they think, oh, you know, I work with Alice and she'll, I say air pollution is oh, something I care about, but I'm here to work on climate change. And um, it's often people talk more about things like air pollution because it seems more immediate than, than climate change. Mm. And um, I mean, the other thing is to do, with, I think another way in which a lot of us will feel it is when it's when it's really hot or there's a mm. storm or something like how much of that is climate change. Mm. And I think that we can't tell ourselves. I think increasingly people are going, pointing at a weird weather event and going climate change. Um, and it, there is one of the things that's shifted in science in the last few decades is actually much, much better, faster science to be able to go, you know, this percentage of, of this is due to due to, to climate change. In fact, a website, Climate Central, I think they're called, uh, launched a map just this last week which shows real time heat in the US. So if you're in the US, you can look at the temp air temperature and look day by day how much of that is affected by climate change uh, because science has got so advanced on this for the richer parts of the world like the US. It's not mm. so great at other parts of the world. Mm. Um, and it, it's, and you know, that's I think an important thing, but it, it's, a, it's not obvious to us day to day. And it does come wrapped up in so many other issues. I mean, it's a definitely um, a big part of, of the work I do at Possible is thinking about, you know, one of the reasons we do work on things like traffic is it allows us to work with people who are interested in noise pollution or air pollution, or just want to move around on their bikes. They're into active travel for health reasons and how that, and how that intersects with, you know, a lot of us will be familiar with, you know, policies for things like low traffic neighborhoods. Are they creating gentrification? Are they helping people? Are they hurting other people? How do they affect disabled road users? You know, we can't just look at climate change alone and try and solve that problem alone. We have to think about how it intersects with, mm. with other parts of our lives. And, dis mm. you know, we've built a whole infrastructure for fossil fuels that's been tangled into our lives. So how can we untangle ourselves from that without hurting people? Mm. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a real, it's, that's part of what makes it so challenging. I think yeah. One last thing I'd say on all yeah. this is that I think we are getting better at going storm, climate change or something, but we have to be careful we don't do it too much mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of, there's a chance, and I think this is something we'll see a lot more of in the next few years, you'll see politicians avoiding dealing with other social problems by going, oh, it's climate change. Mm -hmm. So rather than saying, oh, this, uh, this famine is caused by huge amounts of social inequality and economic inequality around the world and, and you know, decades of, of um, mismanagement by something or other or the fact that you know 200 years ago this country was colonized and they haven't really they they deserve some kind of reparations maybe and things like that instead of looking at any of those questions they got with climate change yeah. it's come from the sky you know and it's like a an way of, yeah and i think we all have to be careful of that mm. and climate change activists while promoting the fact that we recognize climate change have to be careful that we don't then just allow ourselves to be used as an excuse for other things mm. that's really interesting um I'm going, to, I'm going to try and bring in a couple of, uh, we've got a couple of questions from the audience. I thought that'd be interesting. So, so the first one goes back to, a little bit goes back to the, the question of why history, uh, but also I think it's related to the idea of, you know, gathering all of the data that we, we now can gather. And, and it's a simple question in a way. It's, do you think we'll ever learn from our mistakes of the past? Yeah, I mean, I think lots of historians love to tell people, you know, historians get fed up with people saying that history is about learning about the mistakes in the past and sort of like, there are no lessons from history. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't just, and, and I, I did feel that a bit and that you'd read it and you go, well, we could have learned from this problem that happened, I don't know, in 1870, that we should have acted differently in 1870, but that's not going to help us in 2026. Um, but there are things I think we can learn. I think there are things that we can particularly, I think, looking at the history of energy, um, I think we really learned, I could, I could see a lot about the power of PR and the power of, of advertising and marketing and promotion to make technological decisions. Yeah. And I think that one side of that is that people who want to promote low carbon energy need to think a little bit more about PR. But the other thing is that all of us could think like, we can make better technological decisions than just based on what's advertised to us. Um, 
and uh, being canny about the power of PR and yeah. thinking about that. And another one is on is it being aware of how how many different ideological approaches to how we do energy there were on mm. offer in the 19th century like there were a lot of ideas about uh, how electricity in particular would allow us to work together in communities a lot more about community ownership and cooperative ownership of energy and in fact a lot of people really hated the idea of electricity because they thought it was going to allow um, a lot more power for the left mm. and that's not necessarily how it emerged if anything I think it's really interesting the ways in which our gas system and then electricity off the back of it they had a very similar system networked us it connected us to our neighbors in a way that we'd never previously been connected to our neighbors because we all had our own individual fire i mean we might buy coal from one company mm. but we had very atomized approach to energies and now we are very very connected um and yet we just have our relationship with the energy company mm. we don't connect to our neighbors so mm. i have a shared i live in a slightly weird heating system in that it's we have a communal kind of um heating system in our estate it's uh what something a lot, a lot more more and more people will probably be part of in the next few decades but it, particularly if they live in cities which are kind of heat networks and also ours breaks regularly <laughs> and because of because of covid we have a much more active local whatsapp group like a lot of group communities we all became joined a local whatsapp group and so now whenever it breaks i can much more effectively talk to my neighbors to find out that it's not just my problem it's a local problem and then we can count the council and sort that out but before we had that coincidence of covert covid whatsapp groups um we weren't connected to our neighbors mm. unless we actually went and knocked on the door which you know which mm. didn't always work because they weren't in or whatever um and so i think i'd really like to I, it's, I think it doesn't necessarily point us to how we should do energy today but i think it does help us make decisions to know that there were different visions of society and different mm. patterns of society on offer relating to our energy mm. system in the you know in the 1860s and we could mm. you know we could re we think that you know it yeah. doesn't have to be the way it is absolutely uh, let's go back to that pr point you were talking about uh, right at the start of that answer um tell us about jaywalking how that came about and the influence of pr companies and all that because i thought that was absolutely fascinating yeah i mean there's two sort of stories which i now like almost kind of put on a curriculum for anyone working in climate cons now that i kind of read up more of for this book one is is jaywalking the other is littering and they are both kind of one at the beginning of the 20th century one sort of sort of 1960s kind of mid to end um and the the ways in which basically industry pr shifted our relationship to products and put the blame on different moved the blame away from companies <laughs> and so jaywalking uh, is the idea that you shouldn't walk in the street when uh, cars should be moving when cars first emerged as a product that people would have they were it was rich people who had them they were quite rare and they were associated with sort of boy racers the rich <laughs> sons of, of people who made a lot of money out of industry um, at the turn of the century and they're very unpopular <laughs> and they were also seen as really dangerous so um, after world war one in parts of america you'd have these monuments to the war dead like we have in the uk people very familiar with but next to them there were often monuments to the road dead of people who mm. died in car accidents uh, and they've been taken down or fallen apart because they haven't or they haven't been kept up in the way that we've kept up our sort of mm. monuments to the war dead and i think it's really interesting to see that and so, but that shifted and that shifted very rapidly and part of the reason it shifted was that more people could afford cars so henry ford made them cheaper and so more people felt sympathetic to car ownership because they had one or they had a friend who had them and, and the cars got safer but it's also because the car companies deliberately created this idea of the jaywalker as a negative thing and you were bad if you were a jaywalker it wasn't the car getting in the way it was the the jaywalker and they used the word jaywalker uh the j being a particular type of bird uh in the rural areas normally and it was used as an epithet for people who had come from the countryside to the city and didn't know where they were so people who right. turn up in the big city and don't know what to do country and are confused bumpkins, by the big yeah. city yeah country bumpkin exactly right? and they came up with this phrase a sort of country bumpkin of the street and so you didn't want to be that you wanted to be a proper urbanite who knew how to get around town and you were told you're a jaywalker and it's also it's the swap from a joyrider that was the thing the criticism was the joyrider and you can imagine someone sitting in a pr firm going we don't want joy riders, we want jaywalkers. And they did it, they managed to change people's views to do that power of like a really good PR company. The most, and they did all sorts of different things for advertising this. I think the most insidious thing they did, which is really amazing, is they got Boy Scouts to give out leaflets saying, you're a jaywalker. So this moral authority of this little boy, you know, at a Christian mission of the Boy Scouts, giving you out a bit. So if you walked across the road when a, a car could have gone, they said, oh, the car should have gone, should have let you go. Do you not realise that you are the person at fault? Mm. Here's a leaflet on the problem of jaywalking. 
and people believed them. Mm, <laughs> and now, I, I mean, there were lots of other things that happened. There were a lot of other political decisions about um, the growth of roads. There's a play, I think, just finished at um, a theatre in London with uh, Ray Fiennes about, uh, uh, which was I saw in the cinema. It was one of those ones that was projected in cinemas across the country yeah. um, called Straight Line Crazy, which is about a, a road builder, basically, in the States, a uh, very powerful person. Anyway, people like that, you know, they made decisions to build our cities around the car. Mm. Uh, and it also came from the fact that people liked cars and bought them and sort of felt invested in them. But yeah, it's yeah. an amazing bit of PR. And yeah. it's sort of mind blowing when you walk across it, it, the street. It is. Now and the it is. Power I, I, of it. And you then go on and talk uh, a bit later on about the, the power of the PR companies and how they uh, they learned lessons from the way that um, cigarette companies uh, responded to criticisms uh, of their products. Uh, again, you know, I thought that was a really fascinating uh, a bit, bit, a bit of the book. Yeah, there's a, there's a really good book called Merchants of Doubt by Eric Conway and and. Uh, Nomi Orisks, uh, and they trace how the PR companies were employed by the oil industry, well, first employed by the tobacco industry to fight um, the idea that tobacco, when the link between tobacco and cancer came out, that the PR companies fought this by investing in scientists and creating this idea of doubt mm. and saying, oh, we're not sure. So they make it sound as if they're being very scientific and very sympathetic, like, oh, well, obviously, if this is a problem, we should study it, but we need to be scientific, so are we sure? And mm. they do things like they get an asbestos researcher and invest in him and get him to say well i don't think it's uh, i think we've got to be careful that we don't say cancer is just down to tobacco because that's shifting the blame from asbestos now he's right to say that just that, like that thing i said earlier about climate change being used to shift blame from uh, other structural problems you know but they're you know they're not doing that because they believe in the power you know the importance of, of taking companies that are uh, not being careful about asbestos to court they're doing it to shift attention away from tobacco yeah. and the, all sorts of tactics like that that then the oil industry employed the same PR companies with the same uh, advice in the 1980s to do exactly the same thing but with the link between uh, fossil fuels and global warming and mm. spread doubt and grow what was already you know this is it's natural there'd be some skepticism about global warming it's scientific it's normal but they grew that from there just being a small marginal it's a part of the world you know there are there is a flat earth society this these things exist to being amplified something that made its way into the mainstream and so you till you get you know uh media places saying oh we need to balance the idea that climate change is a problem with the one that it's not mm, you know that mm. that that being created but the other thing that's really important to know about that and interesting about that is that the tobacco industry themselves kind of borrowed some of this stuff from the oil industry fighting against air pollution and um in cars a big pre-war in the interwar period and so actually the oil industry had been at this for a long time and pioneering some of this stuff as early as the 1930s mm. so so is this is this also a money thing I, i'm just wondering whether or not you might say that some of the climate activists climate campaigners have been perhaps tactically naive or, um, or or is it a case that they haven't been able to uh, uh, access the same resources to enable them to employ the same PR firms to get their message out in the same way using the same kinds of approach? Yeah, I mean, I think there are lots of criticisms to level at the, the green movement and at the scientific community. And as someone who feels a member of both of those communities, I uh, feel as you know, important for us to be self-reflexive and self-critical. But at the same time, we are up against a monster with the oil industry <laughs> uh, and to some extent the agricultural industry and the ways in which that is so connected with how people live their lives. Mm. It is so much part, it's so ingrained into the world. Uh, and with that, there is a lot of money and a lot of power um, that, you know, yes, we should be critical of uh, what we do, but also we are fighting a monster. And mm. I think and without saying... You know, that means it's OK to be totally rubbish because, all right, we're fighting monster. We've got to be better, you know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's and one of the things I really I didn't really realize properly until I probably started writing the book, which was that the oil industry, you know, like I said, this sort of there were different versions of how we do energy on offer in the 19th century. And we went a particular way, particularly with the oil industry. The oil industry was already a very untrustworthy actor before the climate crisis became a topic. Mm. You know, they were already playing games with air pollution stuff in the 30s. And I mean, get in fact, things like Standard Oil, Rockefeller were pulled apart due to US anti-monopoly laws mm. in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, very effectively. And there were very lots of people were very critical of them. The idea of big oil as, as a problem uh, was, was very established. But there, there was all sorts of human rights problems. I think there are some really problematic things to do with the way in which particularly 
sort of British associated oil companies were constructed with respect to colonialism. You know, it's a very different story. Oil and colonialism is a very sort of 20th century version of colonialism and power compared to coal, which is much more traditionally 19th century. Mm. But, you know, then there were problems with the power dynamics and who had power and how power was centralized and how they were allowed to get so big and so powerful. And I think if we had, if the, I may, we, we'll be careful about using the word way, if the world had constructed the oil industry in a different way, maybe we would have had a more powerful uh, uh, response to the climate crisis. And there is another universe out there where it's much worse than it is for us. And then there's another one where, yeah, the oil industry was, I don't know, built on a co-op. Yeah. Uh, and was much, Or maybe, you know, I mean, the other thing is, uh, I don't think we, sh we should be careful of thinking about this too simplistically in terms of ideologies like the the soviets were very into this and i don't you know they're also very environmentally damaging and like there are there is also versions of this where the kind of socialist ideas of the energy of energy run out and a socialist vision for energy won out but it's still just as polluting mm. um but it, yeah it's, it's definitely the we we ended up with a very particular type of, of oil industry mm. and that's part of the problem, I think. Mm, okay, so, so uh, one of the interesting points in the book that uh, uh, that came out was discuss the discussion you have about the nuclear bomb and the the way in which uh, nuclear and awareness of the dangers of nuclear kind of contributed to growing concern about the impact of technology on the environment. So my question is kind of, you know, do, do we ironically owe some of our uh, modern day climate change anxiety to the, the, the bomb in a way? And there's a link question from one of the members of the audience, which is just about, um, given that at the moment we seem to be the perfect perfect time for developing sustainable energy, why is it that so many countries are going back to more traditional methods of producing energy, like Germany uh, shutting down nuclear power stations but increasing the amount of coal production and coal use that it, it has? I mean, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, nuclear is so interesting as a topic. Um, and I, I mean, it's it's it plays a very complicated role in the story. So in some ways, we owe a huge amount of climate science to, to the nuclear bomb and to effort and interest in nuclear energy. Um, and in many ways, a lot of those geophysicists who were studying um, uh, climate science, who's pioneers of climate change science in the 1950s and 60s, were related to that kind of movement. Um, and that was very positive because it boosted budgets. <laughs> I mean, it also relates to the Cold War. I mean, there was also a lot of ways in which we owe our understanding of climate change just to the Cold War much more straightforwardly than the bomb. I think the bomb was kind of, and to some extent, nuclear energy as it connected to that, uh, were kind of related, you know, it came from this sort of, the background of it was, mm. was uh, the US versus the USSR. Um, I mean, there's everything from building satellites, which has been really crucial to climate uh, change science and from the beginning of satellite technology climate change science was involved in part of that mm. this big project called international geophysical year in the late 1950s which was a way of kind of pretending that all the scientists were working together and having kind of an attempt at world peace through science which was just a mirage basically as an excuse for people to do lots of military important science <laughs> uh, but off the back of that we got things like funded like the the keeling curve project that i mentioned earlier the the mm. study of um how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, which is a project that was set up for the International Geophysical Year in 1958, and is still running today. And if there are any scientists on this uh, call, you'd like, be amazed that there is a science project that's been running from 1958 to now. It's incredible that they managed mm. to maintain funding all that time. But that started because of that, and it comes out of that. Um, also things like, you know, like, on a more just very scientific level, like there was investment in carbon dating, which could sort of come out of interest in archaeology, but was given the funding because military scientists were interested in tracking radiation, which was really helpful for tracking carbon dioxide through the atmosphere and really gave a really big, important boost to our understanding of, of, of the climate crisis early on. But then on the other side, there's all these people who went, oh, it's not really a problem because we're listening to all these promises of nuclear energy. And that didn't come to pass. Mm. Now, one version of that is it was never going to come to pass. It was a problem. Another version of it is it didn't come to pass because the environmentalists pushed against it. Mm. And I think there's, you know, there's been a, I think it is a problem that there is sort of a, a real kind of the, the discussion of nuclear energy isn't, is a bit 
uh, dysfunctional, you know, sort of like you're either pro or you're anti and you can't yeah. sit in that. I, mean, I think most environmentalists do sit somewhere in the, in the middle, but it's very hard to talk about that in the middle because you get the conversation gets dominated by people sort of sticking there. You know, they go, you've just said nuclear and you can see them kind of rubbing up and going, right, which side are you on? <laughs> wow. And that's been true since the 1970s. So you sort of see all these fights uh, between environmentalists about nuclear and you think, I really wish you'd been talking about climate change. Mm. Um, and then you see both sides trying to, I mean, particularly you see an interaction between people who are nuclear advocates and advocates for interest in climate change in the 1970s. And I think part of the problem with that was then the mainstream environmental movement, like groups like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth went, oh, it's all the nuclear lobbyists. I'm not really interested in climate change. It's just one of those things those nuclear people say. And I think there was a right. cultural divide between the green movement and climate change, which to some extent still exists. Mm. And doesn't see, like people, who've come to this issue in the last few decades think why would environmentalists not be interested in climate change but that you know there was a sort of feeling that that was something other people do and I still meet environmentalists uh, occasionally who say oh that climate change lot and they see them as sort of other and as a bit weird wanting mm. to promote things like nuclear or hydro Mm. um and they sort of you know because there are invi huge environmental impacts of, of all sorts of mm. of energy you know uh wind energy particularly hydro you know, hydro is, a, is as dirty a word as nuclear in some areas than of the environmental movement um and you know these are things we need to talk about mm. right and all our energy systems have environmental impact mm. um but yeah it's mm. sort of had this it's had this complicated role as nuclear mm. i think it's mm. played both very very positive roles and sometimes less ones i mean the, mm. the answer to the, the audience question is yeah i mean i i think it's a shame that the that, that germany has made some of the decisions it has on nuclear i'm not i don't necessarily think that britain should be investing in loads of nuclear going forward i think mm. it's a bit disappointing that we're doing that johnson is doing that rather than focusing on mm. some renewables policies and energy efficiency policies that could be both speedier wins and more long-standing mm. and less ex eye-wateringly expensive mm. Mm. <laughs> um in many ways, you know, I think the economic argument is pushing us against nuclear forward, but that doesn't mean we should be closing down the ones we've got. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. but Dif like any of these things, they're complicated and there's they are, cost they benefits are. for all of them. And we saw, I mean, the nuclear, uh, the nuclear issue was thrown around in House Commons yesterday during question times when Johnson, Boris Johnson announced that uh, there would be a, a, a nuclear power station built every year for the next 10 years, uh, you know. Let, let's, let's come on to a slightly separate issue, perhaps. Um, and I think it's it's a theme throughout the book, and it's about and it, and it relates to your background as well as a kind of communicator of science. Um, and I, I found this wonderful phrase you had in chapter two, where you're talking about the discovery that essentially air was more than just air, that there were other things in it, that there were different gases. And you used a phrase which said, "We have to be taught before we can imagine all this." And I thought that was a really interesting thing. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about whether or not part of the problem on the climate crisis debate and the reasons why perhaps there haven't been more political movement is an inability uh, by scientists to communicate effectively on, on what they're finding and to engage with political matters as well as scientists. Um, it's one of those questions where like, like ish. So I think, yeah, there have been big problems on, uh, uh, there've been places where people could have communicated more effectively. I think there have been divisions between the scientific community and uh, the media and politics and things. There's been a disagreement in the scientific community about how to do communication, about how to do political engagement. But also that's inevitable. Those disagreements are probably a good thing. We should be talking about how we do politics and how we do comms. Um, and the main problem has been there's been a lack of investment. And part of that is a problem that the scientific community is, is on the hands of the scientific community. You know, the regular, anyone who writes a, a bid for scientific research sort of like you put most of it into doing the research and then a tiny little sliver into comms. And comms is cheap compared to putting a satellite up or getting a, a ship to go to the Arctic. So you don't necessarily need that much, but you probably could do with a bit more. As I, an old colleague of mine used to say, scientists could do with appreciating that science doesn't finish when you publish the paper. You know, there's so much more work that has to happen yet. And if you felt, you know, you felt a connection to your science beyond that, scientists who do feel the connection to their science beyond that, I think are really good custodians of the science and, mm. and work very effectively in that. I, on the whole, in, cl in climate change, most scientists do get that and they mm. appreciate the importance of that and they do put investment into it. But it's a bit, they maybe could have put more investment earlier. Mm. And I think there's mm. still more investment. But then the bulk of that is that they're not getting enough money in the first place. You know, yeah. it's that thing of like, well, we've got criticisms for the scientific community, but mainly, why is the oil industry hoarding all this wealth? You know, why do they have all the power? And so, yes, it could be better in places, but equally, uh, we shouldn't be having to fight such a, a ridiculously unequal fight in the first place. Yeah, no. um, 
And uh -huh. I think we should stand up for the fact that there has been a lot of learning and that a lot of people have had to learn as they go. So a good example is the IPCC mm. often get the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, really important body for communicating climate change, often get criticised for not doing enough. So first of all, we can't expect them to do everything. Like they need to exist alongside a lot of other things in an ecosystem. Let's grow that ecosystem so they don't have all of the pressure on themselves. Secondly, yeah, they started off having like one press officer and now they have several. <laughs> they've learned and they've learned how to, they, they do it much better now than they did before. And that's fine. That's how that works. Like, yeah. No one knows how to do climate comms, even though I said like we've been doing, you know, been at this since the 1950s. That is still not that long ago mm. in terms of like learning how to do these things. And considering mm. how incredibly underfunded it is, I think it's fair that people make mistakes as long as we learn from them. And I think mm. on the whole, people have learned from them. And mm. I think we should remember that. So some of the, your um, your harshest criticism, I think, if that if that's a fair thing to say, is aimed at the climate de deniers and the scientists who've who've voiced sort of climate denial ideas. And, and you, you point out how far back this all goes back. You talk about Zadkiel's almanac. Uh, do you want to just say a word about that? Well, I think, I mean, Zadkiel's an amazing story. He's this sort of, uh, he kind of got into science. And he was a sort of, he was an astronomer and he was really interested. He's one of these people genuinely interested in science. Like he well, was interested in the sky and what went on in the sky. It was why he was an astrologer. He's an astrologer and an astronomer and a meteorologist and he believed that we could predict the weather in a way that we could predict the future in a way that we now look at and go that is completely unscientific and he <laughs> had a lot of criticisms for scientists at the time who at the time were looking at it going that is completely unscientific um but he was very popular because he sold astrology magazines and people want to know the future even if no one can actually give you know even if crystal balls don't exist we kind mm. of it's reassuring to think that they might <laughs> um and so he had big fights with, with meteorologists at the time in the in the mid 19th century and then you see sort of i mean the first climate skeptics were from the the scientific community themselves and i think some of them were totally appropriate you know they were basing that on the best science of the time they looked at that early work the swedish scientists did and did some lab work and initially mm. it looked like some lab work said actually these things that foot and tyndall said in the 1850s aren't true and then Guy Callender looked at some other data and went, I think we should look at this again. And so with some new techniques, equipments like computers to do better number crunching and stuff in the 1950s, people go back and go, oh, ah, those lab results weren't actually that, right? There's this other thing we're going to put in it because the world is complicated and it mm. takes several goes to find that out. And that is that is how science works. You know, you mm. look at things, you find stuff out, you're always getting a partial picture. And what you're doing is building up a, a less and less partial, but a bigger and bigger and more detailed picture. And that, mm. that's just how science works. What happened in the nine, by the 1980s, though, is that some people started funding those bits of, of skepticism that, that still exist and kind of amplifying it. And I think I think I'd say that my criticism isn't necessarily for those individual scientists. It's more the movement that decided to amplify that mm. and, and the fact that, that was given the, space to breathe. Do, do you think that the the way the press operated in, in has operated in the last 20, 30 years, the the obsession with balance? on every you know, debatable point um, has played right into the hands of those who are organizing and funding the climate uh, denial science. In some places, uh, I was actually, one of the projects I worked on as an academic was a very big study of the BBC with respect to balance and science that came out in 2010. It's known as the Jones Review. It's still often cited when people are trying to beat the BBC about balance and climate mm. change. Uh, and actually, we found that it wasn't necessarily that bad. I think there were there were problems and there still are problems. And I still find sometimes I get a journalist who says, oh, I don't know if I could say that. I think I need a climate skeptic. And you're like, really, do you, really? And they'd be like, oh no, maybe I don't. <laughs> I think there was some political naivety that was taken to uh, talking about climate change on the part of some people who reported on it. But I think that was true. That political naivety existed in the political community and in the scientific community. And that, again, it's the blame is with the PR agencies that could manipulate that naivety and those structures. Um, you know, it's the job of a PR company to see those weaknesses and manipulate them just in the way people are manipulating ideas of free speech. Mm. Um, I, I mean, yes, there are lots of places in which it could be better. I think mm. overall, I think it says with a lot of this, it's just under investment. I would like to see many more climate specialist journalists and climate pages. And it, something we have seen the last few, last two, three years is a, is a big uptake in that. Mm. Um, more and more mainstream um, 
organizations, the BBC, Sky, you know, it's increasingly I find when I do a, a spread across, it used to be I check what the climate news was every morning and I'd have like all these tabs open of things I need to read and maybe like half of them would be the Guardian. And that's not true anymore. Mm. Um, you know, to have the Guardian and the, the BBC, you know, Roger Harriban always on his beat, but you know, like, and then the specialist press like Carbon Brief. And now like, particularly the independent is really, really investing mm -hmm. in it. There's lots of really great specialist uh, spaces that are creating stories, which then make themselves into, into, into bigger news press. And lots of the America, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, really investing in 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 climate change as a topic mm. that they know their audiences are interested in and mm. so investing also in journalists who know it mm. know you know they can and they you know good journalists knows what the pr people are going to try and spin and can mm. rebut that um you know and, and veterans of that you know people who've been around it for a while you know uh can do that and i mm. i think i think we're in a much stronger place than we were and i would have liked to have seen more investment but then you know I used to work in the media. There isn't much money going around. <laughs> Again, this is to do with sort of structural political problems in our in our democracy. Mm, mm. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that actually because I was going to ask you about um, the first Earth Day in 1970 and the activist Dennis Hayes. And one of the things he noticed, and actually this is linked also partly to a question that's been raised by one of our audience members who's based in the Philippines. Um, and Dennis Hayes said at the time that uh, the conversation was very much about putting filters on smokestacks rather than about corporate irresponsibility. So he was kind of saying there was no proper structural or analysis of structures uh, and structural inequality. And the question from the audience, um, from, the, from, from our friend in, in, in the Philippines, relates to the idea of, of compensation and reparations, I suppose, for um, environmental damage done by the developed world to the developing world. I just wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. I'll take them separately. So first on the Earth Day, um... I mean, it, up to then, the environment movement was, well, the mainstream environmental movement was very white and very rich, particularly in the US, the conservation movement had been pioneered by some of whom were fascists as well. Like people think, oh, the environment was loads of hippies. No, they were very, very right wing. Uh, and they were very establishment, incredibly establishment and very rich. And it was, and then the UK, you also see groups like WWF being formed. And there was a sort of sense, oh, well, we have to go and save Africa. <laughs> from you know there was this mm. very colonialist approach mm. to saving ideas of the natural which in the u.s was also expressed as sort of like we have to build these na national parks and preserve mm. an idea of america which involved clearing out native americans to preserve an idea of natural america i mean it, it's mm. really some of it's quite interesting like earth day came along it engaged those communities but it also brought new people in it brought the people who the sort of uh kind of new social movements that had emerged in the 60s and had a different approach to power who sat around fighting about you know questions about particularly thinking about issues of race issues of class and issues of gender um and you know the, the guy you mentioned particularly the leader out there he was working class he wanted to talk about uh relationships of power uh, particularly with with corporates and calling corporates out but also i think after that you see the emergence of the environmental justice movement particularly in the us you see uh groups led by black women uh raising a lot of of the connection between pollution and inequality so sometimes this is about saying it's about uh corporations and we need to be calling out businesses but also looking at how uh issues of race and gender and class intersected beyond just that um it took a while because it was a movement led by black women for other people in the movement to listen to them but i think particularly in the us notions of environmental justice have really made their way into the movement um, i mean it's 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 formalized increasingly in us policy and um, i think when we talk about climate justice it's often very much informed by that movement as well um, and so i think we have you know we have better a better political understanding of the issue because of that and i definitely think that i mean earth day wasn't the precise moment it happened but it was certainly in articulation of that shift happening mm. so in terms about the question of reparations i mean it's i i sort of came to writing this book and researching it thinking yes colonialism and climate change are linked it's definitely something that you know campaigners always say colonialism and climate change is the same thing particularly the more left-wing climate activists and people on a climate justice thing and i was like oh it really is true like all the way through the story so many links to colonialism mm. um and i just you know i really really felt like I that was, that was what I kind of wanted my prejudice that was that that connection was there to be challenged I was almost expecting mm. to read it and go oh no actually it's not true this is just mm. an ideological thing environmentalists say but no it really is um and I think when you look at modern story quite like so it's particularly articulated in the UN at the moment with what gets called loss and damage there which is the idea that 
the richer nations, the nations that have profited and been able to profit from fossil fuels, but also have built a lot of that profit off the back of exploiting other countries, mm. um, should be thinking about paying to help uh, lower middle income countries survive climate change. Because also due to, to some extent, uh, coincidences of geography that are often ones that are most vulnerable to climate change like the UK caused a lot of this problem but we mm. happen to live in a bit of the world which is not going to be hit that badly <laughs> by climate change so I think it kind of makes sense that we would say all right well if there's some spare cash going around we should give it to countries that are suffering more mm. and uh, what's happened is the richer world countries have said all right we're going to give lots of what they say is lots of money but it's actually nowhere near enough and then they you know they're still not actually managing to meet their own promises and then every time they have a conversation about it they get stuck to the extent that I've heard climate people say that oil companies and oil rich co countries have been trying to encourage this conversation because they know climate policy debates will get stuck in this fight over reparations and loss and damage and we won't talk about anything else, which is so horrible and it's a mm. good example of just like how these PR companies and influence networks will just go into exploit everything they can. Mm. Um, but it is an important, we need to be sticking in that conversation, we need to be fighting about it a lot because mm. how we distribute capital is going to be a big part of how we, we, know, we need to get out we need to protect people urgently mm. people are urgently suffering from this mm. and we need to urgently help as many people around the world to stop it from getting worse mm. and we can't be sitting there going oh well i've got this money and i'm keeping it for myself because mm. I, I really think the days of that are, are gone and we need to have a, a I think it's important that we really keep talking about what gets called at the un loss and damage but is is more plainly just about sharing the wealth out of it mm. So I'm really conscious of the time. We're coming towards the end of our session, Alice. So I'm going to leave the last question to um, one of our audience members. And it's quite a nice way to tie it up, I think. As a climate campaigner and with your knowledge of history, how pessimistic or optimistic are you about the future? Um, I often get told that I'm very optimistic. People go, I love your optimism. <laughs> and I think, oh, God, <laughs> this is not how I feel. I think like most climate campaigners, my, my sort of basis is from a quite a pessimistic position like we have to be acknowledged that where we are is very very bad i often say that one of the hardest things about being a climate campaigner is that you can't win because we've already lost mm. and i think about how bad a position we were in in 2005 and how scared i was in 2005 and how little progress and how much worse it is now in 2022 mm. And sometimes it's hard for me to think about that. You know, I think like a lot of climate campaigners, I, I avoid thinking about it too much, but it's important that I do go to that space and acknowledge that pain and, and that fear and don't just go, oh, it's fine. Cause I can, you know, I, I, I live in London and I can largely insulate myself from a lot of these problems. I think it's important that climate campaigners look that problem in the eye. Mm. And I'd invite all of us, I know how scary it is, but to, to do that. But at the same time, we have, um what barbara ward called i think this responsibility of hope you know if we mm. give in to the idea that it's all going to be bad then it will be mm. and particularly those of us who have who are insulated from the biggest impacts you know we have some space and some power and some agency to be able to to do something and so i think it's our responsibility to to have that hope and to make it happen because there are yes it's bad but it's not an all or nothing it's not like everything's mm. awful or everything's gonna be fine we have to live in this sort of liminal, liminal position of like it is pretty bad but how can we make it as good as possible? How can mm. there is still so much of the world to save? Mm. So let's let's save it, let's protect mm. it. And there is there is still we're not in a position where it's all over. You know, there's a climate scientist called Kate Marble who says it's not a cliff you fall off, it's a slope you slide down. And so I think we need to think about being on that slope and thinking about how we can you know try and even it out a bit and mm. put the brakes on a bit because there is there is still there is still space for action and we need to hold on to that and make that action something real and tangible yeah I, we often say i talk about hope and i think if we think about hope as some abstract thing that's going to come from the sky like a magic fairy who will save us that's not going to happen mm. that's a dangerous way of thinking about hope but if you think about hope as something you make and the power of making hope and making hope real and tangible and we hold on to that that's what's going to get us at least as far out of this problem as we can and that's what i invite everyone to hold on to alice Thank you so much for that. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating talk, talking to you. So it's such a wide ranging discussion, I think, as well, you know, the the uh, the intersection of, of the issues of power and politics and deprivation and inequality and climate change. And, and your book covers it just just really, really successfully. So congratulations on that. Um, mm -hmm. Just for the audience uh, who are still listening, the, the recording of the event is going to be available on the, fest, uh, the festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed 
from the Watch Again section of the festival website after the 24th of June. And those of you who are attending, you'll be contacted by email when the video is available to view. Um, if anybody would like to purchase a copy of Alice's book, and I do recommend it strongly, um, our biggest experiment, the history of the climate crisis, that's available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. And you get more information on book sales from either the festival website or you can head direct to foxlanebooks.co.uk forward slash festival hyphen of hyphen ideas. Um, and we very much hope that you'll all continue to be engaged with York Festival of Ideas. Um, you can go to the website yorkfestivalofideas.com for full details of all the events in the festival program. And we'd love to hear people's thoughts about this event or any other events and to continue the conversations using the hashtag, uh, hashtag York Ideas. So, uh, Alice, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, lovely to meet you. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.